That's a good crouch, Cash. The name's Crash. Or Cash. I call him Crash, didn't I? <laughs> Again? <laughs> hey, Mark. The name's Crash. Crash. Whatever. I had a warm spot back there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a nice suit. What is that, a leather? What about mine? Yours sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you call those pecs? Look at me, I'm cut. It's called the gym, pal. Get to one. You're gonna put it on and you're gonna shave. I'm a furry macho man. You're gonna shave? <laughs> Marker? I'm ripped. What do you like? What do you like, five? <laughs> Smile, Cash, and turning. It's Crash, Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do about prunage? Hey, supervisor, boss around. I'm not going to put it on. <laughs> You're going to put the suit no, on. No, I'm not, sir. Swim a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You're nuts. This is nuts. Woo! -hoo. Mark? This is nuts. You're nuts. <laughs> we got to get it. Cut. OK, time out. We got a situation here. Ow! Where was the flip call? I needed a flip call. I was in a zone. I was in a zone. Pavement in your butt? Yeah. I just had a cheese sandwich. I'm all cramped up. What kind of cheese? Come on, shake it off. <coughs> Stop. Hey, guys, give him a little air. He's got gas. <coughs> give me the air. <laughs> <laughs> That's not chlorine I smell. OK, it's a go for Bandicoot. Full throttle up.
name's Christian Davis. I um, was the lead uh, tester for Spyro the Dragon. Today's cool tip is on Spyro. It's on the treetops level, where we'll be showing you how to get to that last platform that's so tough to get to. While you do these next series of jumps, you'll want to be holding down the square button and pressing X at the very end of the ramp to get the most height. From this platform right here, you want to supercharge down the ramp, jump at the end, when you reach the next platform, immediately turn right, jump to the next platform, jump again to your right, go up the wrong way to this supercharged platform, jump at the end, one last platform, jump, and a long glide will take you there. Our next tip for you is in the Peacekeeper's World, Clifftown. You've reached the highest point in Clifftown. You can get to almost anywhere from here. When you glide across the river and get to the dragon that tells you about being at the highest point in the level, if you jump off, glide around to your right, you can glide behind the building you first started in and collect the gems there. Our next tip for you today is on the Peacekeeper's level, sub-level ice caverns. Right from the very start level, if you walk out onto the platform right in front of you, and do a blind jump and glide around the mountain to your right, you'll end up on a platform with three extra lives. That might come in handy. Some people work only for the money. Others do what they love most and manage to get paid for it. Do you mind not interrupting me when I'm working? Stuart Copeland is in the second group. He's been making music all his life, first as a co-founder and drummer of The Police, then as a composer for films such as Rumblefish, Highlander 2, and Wall Street. Now he's writing the music for Spyro the Dragon, his first video game project. What makes composing for video games fun? How does he do it, and why does he like it? PlayStation Underground visited his small, unmarked studio in Hollywood, where he showed us some secrets. Good, we have sound. Step one is to beat the level. Now, for a 10-year-old kid, this is no problem. But for me, you know, I have to beat the level and figure out the jumping, and I, and I kind of navigate my way through the, the uh, levels. In the very early stage, it's a lot of fun because I find a level that I can beat and get an attitude for it, and then uh, create a piece of music for it. But then as the game progresses and I start getting to some of the more difficult levels and I'm stumped immediately, I've got to beat this bad guy before I can stay on that level for long enough to write a piece of music for it. So I have to learn how to beat all the bad guys. And I, 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 if I was having to pay for my helpline, I'd be renting up a huge tab here. So then once I'm, I'm on the level and I've got a general attitude for the game, I have to, within the atmosphere of that level, have a lot of different changes happen, but stay kind of in the atmosphere. Then I go back and I look for how to make those inner complexities more complex, and to have uh, deeper sub-layers um, and things that don't really hit you the first time, but hit you the 16th time, so that it can survive repeated listenings. Roll some of the crevulation off it there. Give it about 60 feet. Well, let me start something. Let me write something yes. for you. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something which is a, a, a trade secret here, but I have input quantized, which means that I can play it very badly, and it comes back played very nicely. I can loop those two bars there, so it'll just go around and around and around those two bars. Okay, now let's get some bass going there. Okay, yeah, so there's a bass line. Now let's get some drums happening. Okay, now. Now let's get some heavy metal going here. Okay. They pay me for this. And then, of course, you can get into all the uh, cool stuff like, uh, okay. 
and copy the, the bass part onto other instruments to kind of thicken it up. And then I add scary stuff to, you know, add to it in various different ways. Where is that? Uh... Now, this is really where I'm giving away the trade secrets. This is where Mozart would be jumping out of his grave and saying, I want to live in this century, where I transpose that part from there up to there. And it plays that same piece of music. So I've just done a whole transition there, took all those instruments and moved them up that much. Looks like fun, doesn't it? In his career, Stewart has both performed music and composed it. We wondered which is more fun. When I play music, I have the instrument in my hand, I don't think, and my hands do the walking. And it's a bodily function. It, it is instinctive, it just happens. Composing all happens in the mind, and my body is an inert, dead fish. You know, different things. Somebody once asked Stravinsky, what's the, what's, what's the, the great moment of of being a composer? Is it when the audience lights up into your music? Or is it the reviews? He said, no, 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 no. The best moment is when you find that note you're looking for and you get that chord which leads to that chord and you've got this under thing happening there which pays off right here. At the same time, set it and you crack it and you've got it, it goes there and it does it. That's it. And it's downhill from there. What's it like to compose for the PlayStation? The Sony PlayStation has room for high quality music that has full bandwidth. It's the same as you get from a CD. Whereas the other platforms has very thin bandwidth. And the thinness of the bandwidth puts an imposition on the composer where he has to create sounds that'll fit within that. On these CD-ROM games, there's so much space. I don't have to worry. I can load up full symphonic sounds there. In fact, I have in this game. I've got a whole orchestra of sounds that I recorded in Utah. I use the orchestra as a flourish here and there to provide drama, because the game is actually quite grand. He's flying through castles, and there's a big sky, and it's a very open, expansive feeling, which is where the orchestra comes in. But for the uh, energy and for the jeopardy, I've got raging rock guitars and drums and pounding rhythms. Any kind of art is about creation of tension and resolution. And in music, it's more subtle how it happens and it's more esoteric how it happens, but it's the same thing. You create a tension and then you release it. The most fun part of the process is uh, being able to be in there like this, and I get a phone call, and I can shout at my staff, don't interrupt me when I'm working. PlayStation Underground's asked me to tell you a little bit about Crash Bandicoot 3, Warp. I wanted to be sure that we preserve the classic intuitive gameplay that has made the Crash series so successful. We found that gamers worldwide truly enjoy the structured interactions of this style. The second thing we wanted to do with Crash Bandicoot Warp is that we wanted to introduce free roaming gameplay. To add excitement, We've created some radically new styles of levels. You still have a mission-based objective, but at the same time, the camera is opened up and you're free roaming. In addition, we wanted to broaden the replay value of the game so that players got more for their money, they got more bang for the buck. We added a time trial mode, but now they can race against the clock. They can compete against their friends, their brothers, their sisters, and they can put up scores with their names in it to show exactly how well they've done. 
In this succession from Crash 1 to Crash 2 to Crash Warped, we as a team and I personally have learned a tremendous number of things. In Crash 1 and 2, the, the maximum distance at which you could see any polygon was about 70 meters. In Crash Warped, we've opened that up to 700 and some odd meters. Like in the medieval levels, there's a, a castle at the end that you can see nearly from the beginning of the level. And as you go through almost a kilometer of level distance, like you keep seeing the castle every time you get closer and closer as you go over press. Because we've been able to achieve things that just haven't been seen before on the PlayStation. One of the accomplishments that we did in Crash Bandicoot uh, Cortex Strikes Back is we had Crash be able to wade into water and to subdivide perfectly in the water, which is something that had really not been seen before on the PlayStation. And at first, there was some debate whether it was feasible. Now we've gone another step in Crash Bandicoot Warp, we have entire rounds where everything is floating in the water. We have environment mapping against waves, and the waves are moving in a very realistic ocean pattern, but you can see the reflections of the world in the waves, which gives a very, very realistic effect. I think most people, including ourselves, until this project thought it was not possible to pull off that, that many things, that much subdivision in a level, that you just would not have the speed to do something like that. I think the way we pulled it off was with perseverance and with trying things and just keep working at it and working at it and working at it until we were able to get within the frame rate that we, that we wanted. We've learned a tremendous amount about gameplay. <laughs> making a new mechanic and trying to make it play well and work with Jason's animation for the character, because it all has to integrate together. Crash is like driving along on the motorcycle and he turns, he's got to bring the motorcycle down, put his knee on the ground like the way a real motorcycle rider does. And so there's a real interaction between the gameplay programming, controlling the feel of that motorcycle and the animation. And that's probably one of the most important programming things, if the game doesn't feel good, if it's clunky, then it's not fun. When we uh, approach a level, this is an example, this is Arabian level M. It's basically somewhere about two-thirds of the way into the game. Um, we think in terms of the player's abilities at that point, and we also think in terms of the, the character's abilities. Now, one of the things we wanted to do was bounce on tarps, because bouncing is a fun mechanic. Kids love to bounce on beds, and it's just always fun to do. We decided to do something that hadn't been done before. In Crash 2, um, all the enemies on the hang section you, you had to avoid. You couldn't um, specifically attack any particular enemy. And in this game, Crash will actually get to fight enemies while hanging. Our biggest challenge has been how to add more depth and excitement. I've always been proud of how Crash's moves need to be used in combination. The new moves, of course, are great. Well, we've, got all, we've got a bunch of power-ups that you gain across the, the game as you play. And what's really nice about that is basically the character grows as you're playing. Crash Warped is combinations like the slide, double jump, death tornado, which add greatly to the depth of the gameplay. At first, they'll just jump on an enemy, but after they get good at the combo, now they'll slide, jump, jump, and hover and come down on them at a, at a much more aggressive style. Uh, the deaths are an important part of this game, as we learned in 2, is that people, if they die and there's something funny that happens at the end of it, it sort of softens the blow of taking a hit. We have the game designers uh, come up with their wacky ideas of what we should do, and we have the artists uh, coming up with their editions of what would look cool with that idea or what would be best suited for that idea. Well, we start out with the uh, just a rough vignettes just to get the feel of which direction we should go. And then uh, once we see that we're in the uh, right environment, then we go straight to the line art. And the line art is a more finished artwork that leads eventually to being a color key, which uh, has the actual palette of, the, of that level. So that way we can take different elements of the warped background and go to the computer and start modeling and start making textures and start applying lighting and, and coloring and things like that. Or I can also do a lot of palette shifts. And if, for example, I can take the daytime and I can make a nighttime version of it rather quickly. There have been a lot of really proud moments for Naughty Dog in the Crash series. But I think maybe the proudest moment has been seeing the culmination of technical achievements and artistic achievements that came together with some of our water levels in Crash Bandicoot Warped. Our, our ocean level is just beautiful. I think we have a gameplay style that is truly new and truly unique. And I think that it's extremely fun, and on top of that, technically, it's an extremely hard achievement. 
Well, you've crashed a few parties before, but I never expected you to make it this far. Now I have to lay down a challenge to the PlayStation Underground viewers. I've heard that you're some of the best video game players, some of the best PlayStation players out there. And I want to see if that's actually true. The Naughty Dogs, all of the Sony testers, our Sony producers, as well as Mark Cerny, have been playing our time trial mode, and you'll be able to find in the credits of the game what all of our best times were. If you don't turn back, I will inflict a thousand years of suffering on you and the entire universe. And the challenge is, can you actually beat that time? And I have to say, within that group of people, there are some darn good players, so it's gonna be quite a challenge. So the challenge is out to you now. bought a game and made some copies to sell over the internet. Now U.S. Marshals and the IDSA are standing outside your door. It's a good time to learn a few facts about software piracy. Recently, the Interactive Digital Software Association raided a New York City apartment where the occupant was allegedly selling illegal backup copies of PlayStation games over the internet. Got an order from, uh, Judge, because uh, fines are as large as a million dollars for each trademark standing. violation, he's facing uh, several million dollars in damages. Twenty websites like this have already been shut down, and that's just the beginning. An official of the Interactive Digital Software Association, who wanted to remain anonymous because of her anti-piracy work, explained. The problem of piracy is growing exponentially every day. Technology is making it easier, but just because it's easier doesn't mean it's any more legal. Making a copy of a PlayStation game without permission is absolutely illegal. I was using these as backups for people who own the original copies. I mean, and I had no aware of it. Because I read rule. I mean, I had a disclaimer and everything. I had, we saw the disclaimer, but the law doesn't work that way. The question of, this is a backup copy, that's a net myth. A backup copy that you buy off the internet because you don't want to buy the original is absolutely illegal. You people who make or buy illegal copies think about who's really getting hurt. One group is the developers, gamers like yourself who put in 12 to 16 hour days for a year or two to develop a game at a cost of over a million dollars. Marketing that game could add millions more. Because making a game is so expensive, it's risky for developers to take chances. That's how piracy weakens the development community. This year, illegal copies will keep an estimated $3.2 billion in revenue from reaching the people who create and distribute the games. That money would help developers start many more projects, take bigger risks, and experiment with more specialized and unusual games. So who does piracy hurt the most? Ultimately, all gamers and the quality of the video games themselves. Here's how the game community is striking back. The FBI has started to take some very serious actions against pirates online, not just for copyright and trademark infringements, but other things like consumer fraud. U.S. Customs officials have begun to do seizures of products of entertainment software coming into the United States. The largest such raid that we have experienced in the last few months occurred in Miami, where they seized 54,000 illegal PlayStation discs. The seizure in Miami is just a tip of the iceberg. Game developers would like your help in keeping the quality of future games high. They point out that many people who don't feel bad about making and using illegal copies would feel terrible if they had to steal a game from a store. Ironically, it's the same thing. For a detailed look at how piracy hurts video games and what you can do to help stop it, visit www.idsa.com. Being a sheep and trying to make it in Hollywood these days is not so great. PlayStation Underground is taking you onto the set of the latest Spyro TV commercial to see how things are done. We're asking an important question. Are real sheep in today's Hollywood getting fleeced? Does that look like the face of a happy actor? He's nicknamed Toasty because Spyro breathes fire at sheep. If you do it right, it's one more. If you do it wrong, it's all 
Sheep in today's world are having a PR crisis. Wherever they go, they're the butt of jokes. Be nice or I'll let the whole crew have their way with you. How can a real sheep compete for roles against the likes of this? It's an animatronic head that was used for close-ups. 21 servo motors make it move, guided by several remote controls. The skull is fiberglass and aluminum. The skin is foam latex. 14 specialists worked three weeks to build it, including a sculptor, mold maker, mechanic, and lab and hair technicians. Genghis, come. Imagine being a sheep and having to share a trailer with a co-star named Genghis. <laughs> Around Hollywood, whatever Genghis wants, Genghis gets. Who thought up the Spiral commercial? These guys from PlayStation's ad agency. We played the game quite a bit, and we noticed that there were some sheep that sort of came to unhappy endings in the game. And so we said, geez, what would it feel like to be that sheep? And that's basically where the idea came from. Why did they use animatronics for sheep instead of computer graphics? I think it helps it stand out. The video games are all CG, actually bringing our sheep to life with animatronic. You know, it just it seems to bring the character more character. That's it from the Spyro set, where the men are men and the sheep are animatronic. Welcome to part three of Project Wormhole, how a game is made. This issue, we're gonna work on game physics and obstacles. Now that we have a tunnel to fly down, things will start to get interesting. Last issue, the car flew straight down the middle of the tunnel. That's fine for just checking it out. But in the finished game, we want to be able to fly and dodge obstacles realistically. We need to consider all the different forces acting on the car as it flies down the tunnel. There is the force of gravity pulling it down, the force of jets on its bottom keeping it off the ground, drag forces from the air in the tunnel, and forces from jets used by the player to control the car. We add all of these forces up to figure out how the car is moving. That's a lot of number crunching, but the extra attention to detail makes the gameplay feel as real as possible. Let's draw obstacles. They're made just like we made the car in part one. We've already done most of the work for this. The tricky part is knowing when we've run into something. It's too slow to look at every polygon and every object to see if they've collided. So we create an imaginary box around each object just big enough to contain it. These are called bounding boxes. We can use them to quickly see if two objects have run into each other. Now that the obstacles are floating in front of us, it's time to blow them apart. We'll make a basic weapon as a placeholder. A laser cannon that shoots bolts of energy in a straight line. More weapons will be added later. In the next section, try out some of the things we just built. Then check out the preview of Wormhole Part 4. And don't forget to visit www.playstation.com where you can join in a discussion of the game at PlayStation Underground Online.
In part four of Project Wormhole, we'll look into artificial intelligence or how enemies are plotting to destroy you. We'll also add sound effects. Don't go away, the fun is just beginning. Something's been shaking up PlayStation gamers for the past few months. It's the DualShock Analog Controller. PlayStation Underground couldn't resist the temptation to look under the cover and see how it works. In each handle is an actuator. That's a hardware term for something that actuates or starts something else. In this case, vibration. The weight on the spindle is carefully balanced to run cool when you're playing long and hot. On one side, the weight is small. On the other, a bigger weight spins. Code from the game determines how long and how fast one or both sides turn for different effects. This lets developers do lots of new things. For example, in Gran Turismo, you can drive by feel, not just by sight. If you drive a front-wheel drive car in real life, the steering wheel vibrates because the engine's so close. That's also true in the game. Jump off the line in first in a front-wheel drive car, and the controller shakes from high power and low RPMs. As you shift into higher gears, the engine vibrates less and less until there's almost no vibration. RPMs are high and you speed along smoothly. Brush against something and that side of the controller shakes. Slam into something and both actuators spin hard to give you a big jolt. Because more of your senses are involved, you'll find yourself drawn deeper into the game. You also get a precise, light steering touch from the analog thumbsticks. Virtually all new titles are being programmed to take advantage of the DualShock vibration feature, including Crash Bandicoot Warped, Metal Gear Solid, Tekken 3, and Spyro the Dragon. Also, a button lets you play any game in standard digital mode. The controller is standard with all new consoles. It's a must-have addition to every gamer's PlayStation experience. Check it out. It rocks! <laughs> 